everyone. Welcome to Chavistas Chronicle from Caracas. My name is Jesus Rodriguez, and today I have the pleasure to interview Camila Escalante from Causation News. And uh, with us, uh, we uh, are going to have also the pleasure of having uh, Sahili Choudhury from the Orinoco Tribune team. And um, we are going to talk with Camila Escalante about the elections in Brazil. And let me let me introduce properly introduce her. Camila is a, a editor of Causa Chu News, a Latin American correspondent for Press TV. She's based in La Paz in Bolivia. And for the last few weeks, she has been in Brazil reporting on the pre-election scene. And today she's joining us from Sao Paulo. Welcome, Camila. I'm going to jump to the first questions immediately. Uh, and, and this is it. Um, in what situation are Brazil's elections being held? Taking into consideration Bolsonaro's policies, I mean, economic policies, wealth inequality in Brazil, healthcare, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, the Amazon forest issues, uh, the police violence, crime, racism, and threats to recognize the results. I mean, I know that there are a lot of things, but I believe that that's part of the debate and the, you know, quotidianity right now in Brazil, the things that are being discussed. So so I'm going to stop there. I believe that that's, uh, that that's the first question and feel free to, to answer it however you want. Yeah, definitely. Well, you're naming some of the things, but, you know, what I'm seeing is that, you know, Brazilians have this sort of sense of Brazil being this grand country or that it's supposed to be. I feel Venezuelans feel very similarly. They think that their country is the greatest country on earth, or at least yeah. one of them. And they want to see good things for their country. They're starting to look around and they're saying they're seeing that the countries that they didn't think were that nice and that were, you know, poor countries or underdeveloped countries or whatever it is, the conceptions that they have of those countries are actually advancing. They're racing ahead. They're progressing. And this country that's supposed to be more industrialized than the other countries of the region that's supposed to have a larger economy, a country of 215 million uh, people, a massive country in, in terms of like the actual size, in terms of biodiversity, um, you know, and, and just diversity in, in population and culture as well. Um, racially, it's diverse. And they're saying, why aren't we moving forward? Why aren't we progressing? And why aren't we developing? And why are people living in such extreme poverty? People are living, um, you know, with some of the same problems that they had years ago. So things are actually, you know, reverting to the way they were before. And so, you know, a starting point when a lot of people, if I'm interviewing people here, they and they said that is the point at which they, you know, the country began to revert back to the way it was back to, you know, the real neoliberal period here. And so we're seeing, you know, the we're seeing essentially wages decline as you know people face inflation, just like they are in the rest of the continent. We're seeing more, um, you know, extreme levels of poverty, and the poverty here is very obvious. It's very apparent. It's everywhere you go in the urban centers. Even if you're a tourist or a foreign journalist, if you go out to, um, you know, out and about in a taxi to tourist places or to cover things the way I do. Is it like in Caracas? Major cities. Is it like Caracas? Uh, because, no, I, I'm not. asking you because I've never been there in, in the big cities of Brazil. So Yeah. Just... Um, no, it's much larger. So Brazil has the largest, I mean, Sao Paulo must be the largest no, city but, on but, the but in the continent. But in terms of the contrast, in terms of the things that you were talking about, the, yeah, that yeah. you can face the poverty. I mean, we face That's the poverty. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. exactly. So this is one of the largest cities on the American continent. So you have to think when you see slums here, when you see people living in whether it's tents or on soggy mattresses under highway underpasses or whether it's on cardboard, um, all these different scenes, it's just more people than I've seen anywhere. I don't know. I haven't really spent a lot of time in Lima or in some of the other, you know, 
there, there, there's a couple other very large uh, capitals or cities in, on our continent. But here, the, the number of people who live without housing or with precarious housing or who are just permanently unhoused, it would seem, and who are, you know, on track to, uh, you know, pass away at a very young age because of issues, you know, related to substance abuse. It's just shocking. And I have never seen it like that anywhere else in my life. I came to Brazil before I had been to Venezuela. And so when I went to Venezuela, when I went to Caracas, my reference was Brazil. And it was nothing like what I've seen here. So, um, you know, it's very, and, and that's of course, Venezuela at the height of the sanctions is what I'm you know, talking about in, uh, in 2018. And so here, you know, it, it has been like that uh, in recent years where you just see more and more people having to struggle to find a place to live. And it's very important, maybe we'll talk about this later, but you know, Brazil is known for having so many strong social movements. And some of those movements fight for things like housing against evictions. They occupy spaces, they occupy buildings, they occupy land um, in the fight for agrarian reform. And, you know, there's all sorts of other things going on that are really just, you know, related to the building of socialism and these like, you know, as collective ways of living and stuff like that. But the, what, the, what they're responding to is the failure of the state. And, um, you know, there's a lot of buildings here that don't serve any social purpose. They're just empty buildings, high rise buildings. Some of them have, you know, massive, expensive, multi-million dollar apartments, uh, you know, things like that. We don't know what happens in those buildings. We just know nobody lives there, but people are out on the street vi visibly. But other people are poor in their own houses. I mean, and that's even more common, right? There's people who are at home. But, um, you know, one of the things Lula has talked about a lot, Lula, the front-running candidate, of course, former president, um, is, is, is that, you know, there's such a high level of food insecurity in, in this country. And so for, for Brazilians, there's a lot of people, families, who don't know what their next meal is going to be um, and who are not able to afford um some very basic necessities at this time and you know all of this is brewing as or all of this is taking place as you know a conflict could be potentially escalating overseas and you know there's been a conflict for the last several months and everything is so uncertain and so you know people are thinking about that uncertainty they're thinking about the way in which things are just going to worsen amid a situation where there's already lack of opportunity for young people lack of employment or good employment, gas prices are high here. So a lot of people because of the crime um, and the safety issues here like to use Uber. They don't wanna be you know, walking in the dark at night, things like that. And now there's a problem a lot of people, locals are telling me that you know, they can't even get an Uber because Uber's, Uber drivers don't wanna go a certain distance and they'll just cancel on you because of how costly the gas is right now. So, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, economic issues that, that people are dealing with. So I think that is, you know, first and foremost, what is on the menu or the main issues for this election. I think it's really important to make that clear because when we talk about Bolsonaro and it's in the media, it's been in the alternative media for so many years, since essentially since 2016, 2017, people began to talk about this extremist figure uh, as some sort of a bigot, um, as someone who, you know, a military man, all these different things about him. But a lot of it was steering people towards the direction of understanding him of someone who's just against LGBT rights, against women, um, against minorities and racists, and the people who support him are all those things too. Maybe they're linked to neo-Nazi groups or they're, you know, some other type of extremists. All of that stuff is basically true. But essentially what the Brazilian left and the social movements and the workers' party, the PT, and the, and the parties that are aligned with them are having to respond to and having to campaign on is the issue of economic rights here. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about identity, although it's very important to have representation in a country that is majority, uh, you know, at least half the population is Afro-descendant. And all, there's, you know, the issue of displacement and genocide of indigenous people, which is ongoing here as well. But largely what, you know, what's affecting everyone on a whole in the working class 
is, you know, the, the economic effects of this bad neoliberal management and, you know, that sort of using and continuing to apply this sort of U.S., uh, you know, template uh, to to govern the country and not, you know, governing on the interests of the people. So people are looking for, uh, you know, common sense economic measures. Maybe I'll stop there. So I'll let you get another question in. Listen, and, and, the, and the effects of the of COVID is not, not right now part of the discussion, right? It is part of the, you know, part of the discussion. And one of the, you know, slogans that people have is just, you know, they just call Bolsonaro genocidal, um, you know, in the sense that he's genocidal against um, indigenous populations and communities in the sense that um, Afro-Brazilians or poor people um, living in favelas, living in Rio de Janeiro, favelas is one of the things that, you know, the media, mainstream media has kind of covered, you know, have been subject to these raids, shootouts. There, have, there has been sort of a Black Lives Matter sort of uprising or movement here as well. Um, but also now in the last like two years, it's been genocidal against the population because of his views um, you know, against vaccination, because of his, uh, you know, inability to act when it was required, when all other countries of the world were, you know, seeking these sorts of different things needed to be able to, uh, to respond to the outbreak and actually create like a coherent policy and procedure for all of this, instead of, you know, letting everyone run wild. So people were really angry about that. I'm not really hearing people talk about it as much as they were kind of before I came here. Now people are really just talking about the economic effects of having, you know, an ill population of not, um, you know, with certain, certain things having to slow down because of COVID and, you know, not having a, a cohesive response to that. So there is a lot of um, outrage to that as well. And I think that, um, you know, people are thinking about what's to come what sort of, you know, if there is, if there was some sort of other, uh, you know, virus or something to break out, that this is not a fit government to deal with that, but more so unfit to deal with the economic uh, situation ahead. Okay. Okay. Let's jump to the second question Sahil is going to ask. And we have, a, a, I mean, within the first question, we had something in reference. We wanted to ask you something in reference to the, to the U.S the military presence in in Brazil and and those visits from the from the South Command people to Brazil but I believe that those questions are better fit for the third or fourth uh, questions so I believe that we better jump right now to the second questions and then we talk about those things later okay so the second question will of course be about uh, the front running candidate Lula if he all the polls that I have seen, they are all giving him huge advantage over Bolsonaro, and there are even talk of him winning in the first round, etc. However, only four years ago, in 2018, there was this huge, like, one of the biggest lawfare cases in recent times. So he was called a thief, he was sent to jail, and there was all these things. Like, it seems like his career was uh, will be destroyed, but it has not happened. And then at present, he is there is every indication that he is going to be the next president again. So what do you think are the main factors that cause this turnaround? I know you mentioned social movements, but I'd also like to talk you, you to talk about the political parties and the media, etc. in the Brazilian electoral scene over the last few years and how all this is contributing to the present political situation in which uh, Lula and the Workers' Party finds itself. Well, Lula still today is the most popular and beloved uh, president in all of Brazilian history. This is according to polls um, that they have always said that. And so Lula has this um, particular belief or claim that he doesn't like when certain leaders uh, government leaders, presidents hold on to power for several consecutive terms. You know, some people roll their eyes at that, probably people from his own party, obviously anti-imperialists generally, because when he says that, he says it kind of in response to sort of 
uh, you know, suggestions that that certain leaders like Hugo Chavez or Maduro, President Maduro, or or whatever other you know socialist leaders are some sort of uh, you know authoritarians who don't want to let go of power and clench onto it forever. So he says, "Me, I am a Democrat." You know, this is the kind, this is the way that Lula speaks. So uh, about a lot of things, right? And and he he will consider those people to be friends or allies, but he still thinks that he's more of a Democrat because. He believes in taking breaks and then coming back. But the fact is that he remained through all that period that he wasn't in the presidency after his mandate. You know, he remained popular. And so when all of this unraveled with, with Dilma in 2016, the first thing people said, and I was here at that time, people said, Brazil, urgente, uh, Lula presidente, como Brazil, urgent, Lula president, right? That was the call. And so, you know, they, they already knew that, like, he was going to be the candidate um, again, that he still had it in him. Uh, and this was six years ago. And so then they started, you know, talking about, you know, who it's going to be. We started talking, we started hearing a little bit about Bolsonaro. But it's not like he plummeted, um, Luba plummeted in popularity. In fact, most people thought that, you know, the claims against him and this lawfare against him was completely trumped up. And in fact, it was, you know, of course, all of those charges have been dropped. He was jailed in 2018, just months ahead of the election, which had the Workers' Party, the PT, scrambling to find another candidate. The person they found was much less popular. Um, perhaps they could have found another person. I mean, maybe those debates exist within the PT still um, in retrospect. But, but who they found was Fernando Haddad, who now is uh, probably the most important candidate uh, besides the presidency, Fernando Haddad, because he is running for governor, just a side note, governor for the state of Sao Paulo, where we are now. Sao Paulo is the largest state in the country. So it's very, very key. And so he was able to raise his profile enough to potentially win for governor. But it wasn't the case that he was going to you know, have a chance um, just getting thrown in there kind of last minute when they wanted Lula as candidate. Uh, to win the presidency. But when Lula was taken to, you know, he was like, I believe he was here and airlifted, if I remember correctly, you know, very dramatically to Curitiba, the capital, the state of Paraná, which is just to the south of here. And he stayed there in a federal prison for 580 days, incarcerated, you know, through the election and everything. But he was widely supported during that period. And you had people outside of the prison singing him good night, greeting him in the morning, holding vigils. And there were huge protests and mobilizations about this, uh, you know. So, I mean, he, he was very popular. And I think it really, you know, for a lot of people, if they thought for whatever reason, you know, there was a little bit of a, of a color revolution here as well against Dilma. Um, and, you know, there were all sorts of claims made and the media, the mainstream media here, much of which was established during the military dictatorship and all of which was controlled to this day by the oligarchy and the powerful, um, you know, wealthy elite, uh, you know, they were absolutely dominating the airwaves with all of this anti-PT, anti-Lula, anti-Dilma propaganda. And so, um, but I think when people, you know, really began to see what was going on here, that they went to, they went to such extreme lengths that they would jail someone just in the nick of time to prevent him from running when he had been leading in all of the polls. And he was formally at that point already the pre-candidate of the, of the workers party. He was the chosen candidate, but they were still, you know, in the period before actual inscriptions, you know, people like to make claims about socialists locking up their opponents but that actually happened here it happened here and the right wing locked up the, the number one opponent who was the most popular person since since his government the most popular president this country has ever had and political figure generally and the candidate um, you know one of the leaders of the the greatest political force in this country's history which is the workers party and the most important you know party now so you know i think once he was out of once he was out of prison and, you know, this is someone who, who has captured, you know, some support from some, you know, more center left, maybe even centrist, I don't know, maybe even center right sectors. So he has lawyers, he has, you know, all sorts of people working with him. 
uh, to make sure that he, he would be able to run in this election. So it's been a long time coming. And so like you said, where we are now, the polls all say that he um, that it's inevitable that he that he is going to win because even if for some reason he wasn't able to reach that 50% plus one in this first round, the polls say that he is going to just win in a landslide in the second uh, round if he's to go head to head with Bolsonaro. It's even more of a dramatic difference. And so, but Lula has said that he thinks it's very important that he went in the first round, that he didn't enter politics to be going to second rounds. And, uh, and you know, they know that they have a lot, a great deal of support because there are a number of uh, like 10 different political parties who are supporting him. Some of them quite large, like the, uh, or who have representation, you know, in the Congress or other positions like the PESOL, like the PES uh, his, um, his vice president is from um, the PDT. And so it's a number of parties and like uh, smaller ones as well, but he's also gotten some, you know, political figures who lead other parties uh, to give him large endorsements. Of course, he's, you know, well known as a very important, historically important union leader who was one of the founders of the CUT, the CUT, the, the Union Confederation. And also, you know, he's led a, a, a historic wildcat strike. And so he has those union sectors, the social movements, um, these different you know, political parties and all sorts of endorsements that he's getting every single day now at all the rallies and all the events that we're going to. It's basically, you know, artists, the one I just came from now was artists, intellectuals, uh, you know, public personalities, uh, musicians coming out to support him. And tomorrow it's going to be uh, sports personalities, which is huge. And obviously a lot of them are going to be from the football world which is very important for, so, oops. So they, so, so they're really hoping with this final push and all these people coming out uh, to give them, to give Lula the endorsement that they might be able to make it to the first round without need for that runoff. Listen, do you wanna add something, Sahi? Hello, go on. Okay, no, and when you mentioned, uh, Camila, that uh, the chances for, for Lula, I mean, the, the mathematical chances and the possibility of winning the first round, uh, these questions came to my mind because I read something a few days ago about the candidate that is in the third or fourth position that some people is pushing him to 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 quit and to and to you know transfer and to encourage his supporter to to vote for 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 Lula is is that possible or or, or is just speculation? Wow! Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, with a little bit of noise in the background, but I understand. Oh, okay. Well, you know, not only do I not believe it's possible, but what a lot of people are saying is that they believe that third place Ciro Gomez is actually in this in order to detract from Lula, that it's strategic and that he's actually working with, with Bolsonaro. At first, people, you know, would say that it is just he's in there because of his like uh, forever desire to someday become president, which I know all about that from other countries. There's always this one guy, you know, a right wing president or right wing. Um, there's always this one right wing candidate or whatever who, you know, who throws himself in there and they'll run a million times. Um, they have a whole team. They have the money. They have the financing to be able to run several times. And, and that, you know, he knew that he would potentially because he's supposed to be marketing he was marketing himself as some sort of left alternative to lula which he absolutely is not and uh but now because of um some things that happened in a, a, a recent debate a recent debate took place televised in which lula didn't participate but people say that they that they saw a little bit of communication between cyril gomez and bolsonaro as if they were signaling each other or some they were speaking to each other you know while on on stage and so you know that that speculation has continued that they might actually be um you know coordinating more than than what was suspected before 
So he has polled consistently in the higher single digits. It is continues to be a two-man race, and it is worth noting that Lula in most polls has about, you know, just a little more than the sum of all other candidates combined. And most other candidates have, you know, 4% or less. So, you know, they're, they're a non-factor. But if Ciro Gomez were to somehow spike, um, you know, it, it, it could have a big effect uh, on Lula. So, you know, that's his, that's his, his, his purpose there is to, um, is to try to take uh, points away from Lula or votes here and there. And there's also people who, you know, because we've, these are both, uh, you know, people who've already been president, Bolsonaro, and Lula. I heard a, a taxi driver tell me yesterday that I voted for Lula before when Lula was president. I voted for Bolsonaro now. I'm going to try Ciro Gomez. You know, it's just a little bit. We hear things like this all the time. It doesn't make sense, but those are the people that they're preying on. And there's also a fourth place candidate. Uh, her name is, uh, I can't remember her first name, but Tebet. And she's running basically as a woman candidate. She's literally running as a woman. And everything her, in her campaign is all about being a woman and about how, you know, women basically exist under patriarchy and experience all these injustices and bigotry and stuff on the basis of their their gender. And, um, but it's really bizarre because she has no policies and no platform and no program. It really is that she just thinks that she can run on that based on the fact that so many people, uh, you know, hate Bolsonaro for for you know his sexism that has been blatant but people don't actually care these are issues of course sexism is a huge issue everywhere but people know that they're struggling with actual material problems that need real solutions and not just like pink and purple you know stickers and so uh, go ahead listen summarizing your answer to the second question uh am i wrong if i said that the the possible victory of uh, Lula uh, is more related to his charisma, to his personality, than to the political parties and the grassroots organization that is behind him. Going back to the question that Sahili asked, I mean, I, I just wanna I just wanna get a little bit deep in there because I wonder if. Uh, Movimiento Sin Tierra, because I know that you are connected to them, or 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 the Communist Party that a few years ago was against Lula, but this time is there supporting the the candidacy. I mean, is there? Uh, I, I mean, are those parties and movement really relevant from the way you see it uh, in a possible victory for Lula? You are muted, Camila. They are very relevant. And not only are they relevant, but right now, the uh, landless workers movement is running candidates throughout the country. And they're running candidates with the PT under the banner of the PT. Uh, and this is the first time in history. But they actually have been mentioned in, uh, first of all, in an interview that uh, Lula did with uh, the two anchors of Globo, the network, the major network here. You know, the P the MST land, this work workers movement was brought up. It was brought up again in the six candidate debate that took place on another uh, major network. You know, it's it's become a, a huge topic, actually. Um, Jair Bolsonaro actually had to respond to a question about it, or maybe he brought it up himself. But he actually said that he made concessions uh, to the landless workers movement. I mean, it's to the point where there's people just walk around with like hats and t-shirts of the MST who aren't even uh, a member of it. It's become such a big thing. And this is a, you know, a very important movement with a, with a, you know, a very, you know, strong, you know, ideological, you know, formation of, you know, of its militants and they do actual work, um, all sorts of things in the fight for agrarian reform, and, uh, you know, having to do with the fight against agrotoxins and big, uh, you know, corporate, uh, well, big landovers, landowners, and, and those sorts of things. And so I do believe that, you know, they are the most important movement alongside some of the other uh, movements that deal with issues related to poverty, who, you know, form the base of the Workers' Party. And so I do think that they're going to be able to exert 
um, a great deal of influence. That's actually happening on a, on a, on a bit of a, you know, not such a strong way, but it is happening a little bit in Honduras uh, with a, a leader of the La Villa Campesina uh, who became the, the minister of agrarian reform, let's say. It's a, it's a longer title than that, but also to, you know, a small extent in, in, in Colombia. And it's so important there, of course. I believe that that will happen this time with Lula, but it's going to be very difficult because obviously with all these different parties, they're going to have to come into the government as well. All these people are making huge demands for their endorsements, for their support of Lula. So it's going to be really tricky. We're going to have some, you know, not so great people who've been called neoliberals by the left that are going to enter government um, as, you know, as a requirement, uh, you know, for all the negotiations that took place up until this point. Um, I, I kind of lost track of what your original question was. You said, uh, you know, how relevant are, well, okay. Uh, actually some very, you know, some of these, some of the leaders, the leadership of these other political parties are very important. They are very relevant. So for example, the leader of the PASOL is also one of the leaders of a housing movement here in Sao Paulo called the MTST. So we in English call it the um, Homeless Workers Movement, not to be confused with the MST. So the MTST, Guillermo Bulos, he was a presidential candidate for the PASOL, but he's always been a supporter of Lula and the PT and actually has quite good politics in general. Um, and so, you know, this time around, he didn't run for president. He was a presidential candidate in 2018. This time he just went right with supporting Lula. And then in the first opening act, he was there on stage with Lula. The other presidential candidate in 2018 of the Pese del Be was Manuela Avila. She's from Porto Alegre, um, which is in the, the most southernmost state here. And she has very good politics. Um, and she has always also supported largely the project of the, of the PT and Lula. She's actually had to step back from politics because of uh, death threats or threats to her safety um, and the kind of like heightened, you know, political violence that exists there in that region of the country and fear for her own, the safety of her children. But she has come out in this presidential election like I said, she was a presidential candidate before. Now she, she came out and did a number of events with Lula. And these endorsements do mean something because these are parties that do have, uh, that do hold political office in, in, in several states of the country and who are very well-known figures and have been very warmly received by these crowds. I think the endorsements mean a lot. And especially because these are not wacko left parties. I mean, just to put it in you know layman's terms, I think, that they are well-respected figures that, you know, they, for one reason or another, they're part of another section of the left, but um, are, are very well-respected and have been coming, you know, about and around and, and promoting Lula in the ways that they can. That's fine. That's fine. Let me jump to the third question, because if, if I don't do that, we're going to talk here forever. The yeah, question is I, this, this one. <laughs> Why is the upcoming election in Brazil so significant for Latin America? Uh, 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 this question is based in the, in the you know, in the peak tight con context and, and how relevant might be a possible victory of, of uh, Lula uh, uh, in these elections. And I, I, I'm going to try to connect it to what I mentioned before uh, uh, on the U.S., you know, I, maybe you can make a, give us some some input about how Brazilians see this uh, some sort of subjugation of the Brazilian army to the Southern Command in the U.S. and all these visits, and that's connected also with the with the aggression against Venezuela uh, uh, when uh, Brazil uh, played a significant role uh, along with Colombia in this issue so anyway i believe that you have a lot of things to do about that thing yeah i mean i would say like the most anti-imperialist sectors with you know the greatest political formation who are most aware of what's going on internationally and throughout the region that have that you know disposition of anti-imperialism against the empire who have a relationship with other social movements have a relationship with the bolivarian revolution the cuban revolution those people are very much against the presence of 
uh, of Southcom and NATO, uh, you know, Southcom as the representation of NATO, they're against the encroachment of, you know, these U.S. military on their lands and territories. They're, uh, you know, against that sort of cooperation between the two militaries. They don't want to be subjugated to, to a foreign country. They're aware of that. But on a whole, I, I mean, it, it is important to say that beyond those sectors and those movements and those leaders who are very outspoken against this, there is this divide, this ongoing like, um, like information divide. People don't really know always what's going on in the neighboring country. And like language has everything to do with it. This is why for us at Calcetra News, it was so important to come uh, report on Brazil because a lot of times Brazil is actually paying more attention to what's going on overseas or what's going on in North America than they are, you know, to their next door neighbor. Bolivia is their next door neighbor. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who believe what they see on the news about Venezuela when the problems here are just the same and sometimes worse. And so this has been a huge problem is that, you know, throughout Latin America, especially places like Venezuela and Colombia and Bolivia, there is a lot of, you know, pushback against, um, against any sort of, you know, intervention by the United States. Uh, they don't want their, you know, they want to be sovereign. And, you know, these sorts of discussions take place all the time. I, I'm not hearing them as much except in the social movements that I've always heard them from. I would say that people are more concerned with their immediate needs and that's what they're responding to. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just like uh, that uh, while you were working out the camera thing, oh. I think that, I mean, how would you connect uh, Lula's possible victory to, like Jesus said, in the context of a uh, new pink tide or whatever is happening with new progressive governments coming up in the region. So I, I'm asking this because in the first one, Lula was uh, very important, like he was one of the very important figures in the first pink tide. So uh, what about this time? I believe that Camila still have issues with the with the connection. Yeah, I think so. Let's this happens with try. these common Wi-Fi things. Yes, yes. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna try to elaborate. I mean, to to share with the with the viewers my perspective on this issue. I'm sure that Camila. Um, I might coincide with Camila in a lot of things. I'm. Uh, I was impressed by what she was saying about the, I mean, uh, at least that's what I understood that people in Brazil right now are paying more attention to uh, their own survival economic issues than to anti-imperialists, you know, uh, and things like, things related to anti-imperialism and, and US interference and that kind of things. And I believe that that's absolutely right. Are you with us, Camila? Hi. Okay. Okay. I was just summarizing uh, what you were saying. We don't have your video. But okay. Now we got you. Okay. So I'm going to yes. keep you running from the pl place where you were left. I mean, you were talking about the Brazilians uh, paying more attention to their own, you know, day-to-day -day problems than to this, you know, uh, imperialist U.S. interventionist issues. Go ahead. So I, I just don't think that this is necessarily the focus of, you know, what people are talking about, at least in the campaign. There's a lot of outrage by certain, you know, people who are, who are very connected to these issues. And so, for example, on my own social media feeds or on Calcetrin News, when we post something about this cooperation and these military exercises, these drills that are taking place with the United States and the armed forces of Brazil, there's a lot of outrage. People share it and stuff like that. But that doesn't represent everyone. And um, part of the reason is because there's a difference between the PT, the Workers' Party, 
and, you know, what have been the governments of the PT, because the governments of the PT have had to be more pragmatic and work with different sectors. So they can't come out with this really hardline anti-imperialist rhetoric. And so it hasn't been a part of their discourse during the campaign. And they know that speaking like that, speaking, you know, from the top as Lula or the, the main leaders of, of the PT on stage, speaking about imperialism, speaking about, you know, socialism, uh, you know, this is not going to capture the, the sort of, you know, voters that they need. They already have all of the left wing and the anti imperialism and the social movements in their pocket. These are the people who have always supported them. So they're trying to get the vote and the attention, you know, and the admiration of these different sectors, largely who are like center right. So they're not talking about it. So it's not really becoming an issue. They're focusing on, you know, domestic things. They do say that, you know, they want more respect in the world you know, better, they want better engagement uh, from Brazil in multilateral institutions. Uh, they want Brazil to do better, you know, as a government on the exterior and be respected by the great powers like the United States, European Union, China, and Russia. But it's not, they're not really talking about that issue right now. And so um, while it's important, maybe it'll come up later. And of course, you know, Lula's former government had also previously been uh, criticized for not being anti-imperialist enough for some of the decisions that he made during his former government. And I think that was heavily criticized before, but it's not swaying people or even coming up in this electoral uh, uh, race. Listen, and the, and, the, and the pink tide context, do you think that uh, Lula is going to make the pink tide less pink and more red or the contrary? Uh, I think it's, let me see. You, you know, I, I think that it's just a very important piece of the puzzle and it's very geopolitically strategic for our entire region. Uh, our, the leaders of our region, the governments of our region have to very silently support Lula because of all the different, if you're a socialist government or leader and you show support openly for someone like Lula, first of all, Lula and the PT are going to tell you to shush, to not say anything the process is over. They're trying to, they're actively trying to distance themselves from you just to be able to get to, to winning the election. But, you know, um, in the media and in the right wing, you know, among the right wing of, of these, these countries themselves, let's say it's Bolivia, you know, if it was Luis Arce or Evo, those people are going to be accused of intervening in the sovereign, you know, the, the sovereign processes of, of Brazil. So, you know, there's a lot of hope for that because people know that, you know, one of the biggest things that we have to gain from winning this election is, you know, new cooperation, South-South cooperation with Africa, with Asia, but most importantly, the sorts of agreements we can have with our neighbors um, and the ability to overcome the sanctions against Venezuela um, primarily and what that could mean for, for strengthening, you know, our region. Lula says things that, you know, like he, he admires. One of the things Lula says is that he really admires the European Union um, as, a, as an institution, an organization, um, he looks up to it. I don't know. I don't want to misinterpret him, but he's said it multiple times and he wants Mercosur to be on par with it. And so I'm not sure that that's necessarily bad. We need to see what he means by that. But he's talking about strengthening a, a, a trade block and being seen as equals and treated as equals among other countries. And I think that's very important. It's very important that, you know, South America, this isn't going to include Nicaragua or Cuba, but at least these economies be able to stand up to the others and, you know, and, and form, uh, you know, policies and agreements that are beneficial to the peoples here. Uh, you know, something that we haven't seen. We can't have, uh, you know, Venezuela isn't going to be the economic engine or motor for the entire continent or Bolivia, you know, we, we, we need, we, it would be, it would be very important to have such a great country like Brazil that has the capacity to produce and export to, you know, overseas, um, 
to be able to, to have a well-managed economy. Yeah. Other you mentioned and, Venezuela. And... Sorry, go ahead, Sahi. <laughs> no, what are you going to talk about Venezuela? I don't know. But anyway, I, I understand because uh, Brazil is one of the largest economies in the world, not just, I mean, not the largest one in Latin America, but the, in the world, it's one of the largest. So it was like the first time that Brazil had Lula as a president that in, in, during his first two terms, um, there were all these South South relations that you mentioned, like BRICS came out from that. Without Lula being in Brazil, it would not have happened. So I understand that it uh, created this link between South America and Asia, two continents on two sides of the world. So that uh, uh, let's hope that with the coming of Lula again, BRICS will be strengthened and that, that will be very important in the present context because you mentioned the conflict in Ukraine without naming it. But uh, I mean, in that context, it's not just a trading block. BRICS will no longer just remain as a trading block. It will also becoming a sort of geopolitical block too. So it's it will be necessary to have Brazil again as a strong force in that and not as subjugated or something. So I understand. I'd like, I would allow Jesus to say what he was going to say. I just wanted to add you, Camila, because you mentioned Venezuela. I, I, want, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I mean, because Venezuela is uh, in, in political presidential races in Latin America for the last decade at least, is an issue, it's part of the discussion. Uh, do you feel that that is happening right now in Brazil? Uh, because in Colombia, it didn't work with Petro. They tried, they did the same thing against Petro in Colombia with the Venezuelan issue and, and it didn't work. So I just wanted your insight about that. It is, it is all, always going to be brought up and we're always going to hear those comparisons by these media commentators um, and different people, you know, personalities in the news. This country, just like every country, has these very, you know, strong, big personalities in the media who are very famous, who've been around for a really long time, they have a very, like, I would say strong analysis, but a bad one. They're very good at speaking. They really know why communism is bad, why socialism is bad, why Lula is going to ruin the economy, what destroyed Venezuela. They're going to tell you point for point. They're a far better you know, speaker than I'll ever be. And it's really scary because it, it, this is what happens. I mean, imagine what happens to people when they hear this for years on end. Someone who is so articulate, so well-spoken, has such a great presence. And it's also on talk radio talk radio on, on you know when people are driving around stuck in traffic here for an hour and 15 minutes on their way home and they're just you know just scouting out anti-communism non-stop and you know very precisely uh you know they've just read all the books there are to read on it i guess and they've probably written some themselves and so it does come up they're able to dissect the situation in venezuela and completely um and like i said this is within the context of this you know, lack of communication and lack of information between the Portuguese speaking world and the Spanish speaking world of Latin America. That's a huge problem. So people don't really know what's going on and they tend to buy into this stuff. Even some of you know, the most you know, left-wing sectors that you know, have very good political formation on a whole might leave some of these things. And I think that some people get a little bit defensive as well, left-wing people when they get compared, when they believe that Lula or their party or themselves are getting compared to Venezuela, they don't like that comparison. But at the same time, there's a lot of people saying, you know, there are people who, who acknowledge that Venezuela doesn't have worse problems than Brazil. Um, but to an extent, I think, and I've said this, um, you know, people are desensitized to the issues in their own, uh, in their own city. Um, and they're We had an issue there with with the connection again. Um, but anyway, I believe that when she when she comes comes back, we need to jump to the to the last question that is about what unipolarism, right? 
So, so but it's interesting what she is Her saying. Her internet about... connection is worse than yours. <laughs> yes, than yes. I was scared but, because I saw that I think... with all the internet problems that we have been having lately, and that my connection was going to drop, and that haven't that haven't happened at least yet. <laughs> no, no, it won't happen. But uh, in case of Camila, it is happening, I guess, because it's the those you know hotel Wi-Fi. So yes. that happens all the time. Let's while we wait for her, I just comment that I believe that this is the reason why. Maduro does not comment on elections going on in other countries because he does not wish to ruin their chances because he knows. Like, I mean, he knows that if they win, they, that would be beneficial for Venezuela. Just look at Colombia. Open the border. Yes. So, uh, I mean... True. That's mm, true. And, and Maduro didn't I understand. talk too much about, about the Colombian elections and, and, and that make... And in recent elections in general uh, in Latin America, he has been trying to, as you said, to not to make comments or anything that might be used in favor or against a leftist candidate. So, so that's true. It will be, against, but, it will be used against. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it might sound bad, but I understand. I mean, I understand the, you know, why it's tactically important because without even commenting, like without even saying a word yes. uh, in Ecuador, they the, well, associated him with Andres Arauz and uh, and in Peru also where, in Peru in Peru, in Peru a also. few days before the elections, uh, Castillo said something. I don't remember exactly what he said, but He's, I but, remember. <laughs> but, but I remember that I was like, and then President Maduro answered the attack because it was some sort of attack against Venezuela. The comment was some so, so in so in some way attacking Venezuela, and Maduro was forced to to revoke. Uh, but uh, but it's true. I mean, I mean, in some places, I mean, in the case of Castillo, all the you know the ghosts of the Venezuelan. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. the Venezuelan threat uh, uh, was used against Pedro Castillo and it didn't work. Was used also again in Colombia against Gustavo Petro and it didn't work neither. Uh, so I believe that in recent in recent months or maybe for the last couple of years, uh, the media uh, has been using uh, as always the 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 threat of the you know, Venezuela, the country becoming a new Venezuela or a new Cuba, and that, and that haven't helped them. Welcome back, Camila. Hi. <laughs> Go okay. ahead. So, I believe I believe that we need to jump to the fourth question to make your time to yes, let we, you sleep. Yes, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't want you. I don't know if you want to wrap up something. Uh. I was just commenting that Maduro not commenting about elections in the region is good because otherwise it would have, I mean, destroyed their chances of winning. So yeah, let's uh, let's hope that it remains like this and uh, both Maduro win, it, uh -huh, Bolsonaro loses and uh, Brazil gets back on track, which is very necessary, like which would be necessary for the world, I believe. But anyway, now we we'll just do a, a little bit of a speculation. So. Considering that Lula wins, like that that is the speculation. Considering that he wins, to think that he will be a decisive force in moving the entire continent towards the left, uh, towards a socialism, or let's say towards a multipolar world, because that's a, that's the word that's on everybody's lips these days. So would he be very decisive force in the continent in moving the continent towards this new sort of multipolar world that may be coming up? Or do you see a risk that he might become like a Gabriel Boric or Alberto Fernandez um, who have, well, I, I wouldn't come say that both are same, but both have been, well, both have not lived up to the expectations. Uh, this is, I, I am asking you, especially given the context, you have also been mentioning this throughout this interview, that Lula's coalition this time is very broad, that he has say, what we would call centrist or even center-right parties in the coalition, and there would be people from those parties 
coming into the government if Lula wins. So would he be able to have uh, anti-imperialist policies uh, this time around? Lula simply just was not known as the foremost anti-imperialist in his prior government. It's a fact, and he's not known as, and he's not running to be that this time either. So, you know, I think people, they understood what he was and they believe in the economic policies that they believe showed, you know, very good results and brought so much of the popular things immediately in his own hometown where he grew up, where he was a child um, before moving to Sao Paulo. He moved to Sao Paulo where he began working in the factories as a very young teenager. Uh, people know very, um, but before that, he lived in a rural town in the state of Northeast Pernambuco, the Northeastern state of Pernambuco. And, you know, there they didn't have um, access to water or electricity. And they would have like 15 or 20 people living in a home, in one bedroom, one living room or entryway, and then an area that was basically a kitchen or for washing things. Uh, so many people lived like that. Um, and so in that area, they would have to walk miles and miles or go on the back of a donkey to fetch water. And, you know, Lula, when he came into systems, water collection systems, so that people would be able to collect rainwater and not have to, you know, go to a different city to do that. They were able to build schools and hospitals and things that made life easier for people there to urban centers and they'll be poor in some other part of the country and so you know these are the sorts of policies that people want to see people are not really demanding that he be some revolutionary leader but they are looking for stability and i think that's the same thing that um you know the, the leaders of other countries would like to see for example louis arce he would probably like to see uh, a stable brazil that um, to be able to interact with. Right now, um, Bolivia has, uh, you know, trade, uh, you know, a, so, you know, that, that can exist under right-wing government or left-wing government. But I think to be able to advance, you know, some sort of uh, Latin American project, whether it be SELAC or whether it be fortifying existing blocks, um, multilateral organizations. They want to see stability. Uh, they meaning the you know our continental left would like to be seeing you know political stability here, economic stability, and leadership as well. Um, so I think that that's what people are looking for. Looking for. <laughs> he, could go, he could turn further right. He's already been president before. We already know his style of governance. Uh, you know, what we don't know is who's, who's going to bring into all the ministries and all these positions and who's going to be advising him if it's going to be different people. But we know just based on the campaign trail that he's been joined by Celso Amorin, who's his former foreign minister, and these same, you know, these same usual suspects of the PT. So how much could it change in that regard? Okay. Uh, we are having problems with your connections. You sometimes get like lagging a little bit in the connection, but uh, but I believe that we got most of what you said. Uh, I uh, I believe that uh, we need to wrap up. And at this moment, uh, you are free to ask us whatever question you want to ask us about Venezuela and the connection with Brazil. I mean, I don't know, whatever you want to ask, if you have something in mind. Okay, so I'll ask a question, and then if I if you lose me, then that'll just be the end because my phone has already died, and and it's just the, the sound's going to be bad as well as it looks like the internet speed has downgraded. So, first of all, as Venezuelan, what people would hope to see, you know, for for Brazil. 
um, and what they would hope to see out of a PT government. I mean, bearing in mind that, you know, what's most important is that the people of Brazil be able to hold their own, uh, you know, sovereign independent process without interference. But at the same time, you know, these, these don't, you know, these don't sort of election processes don't exist without connection. So I guess what, and then what do you remember, uh, because you've been around in politics and everything, what do you remember of Lula's government? How would you describe it? Because of course, we've heard him described by some people as, you know, some people on the far left, let's so say, like ultra left. We've heard him described as a neoliberal. We've heard him described as, you know, center right, not a real leftist. Um, and, and, and things like that, criticisms of his policies or, or certain decisions he made. But as said during this campaign that he did maintain friendly relations, pink tide or socialist governments at the time during his, during his mandate. So what do you remember? How would you characterize it? Okay, yes. We haven't. I haven't. I have been having trouble uh, listening to all the all the all the questions because of the lagging. But uh, I I believe that I have the the general panorama of your questions and basically, uh, I mean my personal opinion about uh, Lula and and how he uh, connected to Venezuela during uh, his term as president. I can tell you that I see him, uh, as you said, as you has commented uh, several times already. As uh, like, I mean, I mean, he is a, a, a progressive guy, a leftist guy that have to run a, a government with a, with a, a complex government, a complex state like like the Brazilian state, and that have to sometimes make concessions to the. Uh, factual powers, you know, the economic elite and and the, even the the, the 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 elite, international elite, if you can call it like that, which is basically uh, the U.S. and the, and Europe. So in that sense, I I I remember him like that, but I also have this deep appreciation for the. I, at least that's how I saw it. The the I don't know how to say it. the the natural friendship that he has with Hugo Chavez. Uh, whenever you see uh, Lula and Chavez together during those years, at least in my case. I, I I feel that there was a real empathy, that there was a real friendship between uh, the two of them and respect. And uh, that's something that I always like about, about uh, Lula and that I always respected about Lula. And, uh, and I hope that uh, if he wins the elections as he suspected, at least he keeps doing that. If he if he keeps doing the same things that he did uh, while president, I believe that that will be great for the for Latin America as a whole. Of course, uh, uh, if if you are leftist, if you are Marxist, you will always want in him to be a little bit more anti-imperialist, a little bit more Marxist in his policies. But sometimes those things are complicated, especially in big countries like Brazil, like Mexico, like like Argentina. Even Argentina is a complex uh, complex country, uh, you know, in this issue. So so uh, I believe that 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 you need to to be careful as a head of state not to derail a country yes because you want to exercise marxist leninism to the letter you know what i mean so 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 but but and i believe that what's happening in colombia is important leadership and i believe that lula has a lot of leadership also but leadership uh, also means that you have to 
tener guaramo, we say it in Spanish, uh, in Venezuela at least, uh, 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 to have the guts to do things, you know what I mean? To, like like Petro is doing in Colombia. I mean, Petro is, doesn't have a, a bed of roses down there in Colombia. I mean, he have a lot of problems, a lot of enemies, a lot of people that are, are not uh, sympathizing with what he has been doing, but he has been doing it anyway. And I believe that that charisma, that leadership is very important. And I hope, I dream that maybe Lula can take decisions like that, you know, drastic decisions without breaking the, the model or destroying the country, but showing that he has Guaramo, that he has guts. I don't know how to say it in a beautiful way in English. <laughs> that, 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 that he is a decision making maker i mean so so i, I don't know if you want to add something to add Sahe. i know that you, i know that you are out there in india but uh, you are a chavista so you might have something to say about it and like i said leadership is important and as i remember him from earlier like from the last time that he was in government and i was very young at that time but anyway i what i remember of that time is that he has the leadership i mean mm, being the president of a complex country like Brazil is very difficult and he managed it well. And at the same time, I had considered him as the, uh, as the link between the more right wing and the more left wing sectors of the so-called pink tide the earlier time. So he probably is going to be that link again. However, since Camila mentioned certain decisions that he had taken the last time as not being greatest and having been criticized, I believe one of them would be the role of Brazilian military in Haiti, that uh, along with uh, the UN forces, US, Canada, UN occupation of Haiti and Brazil. Brazil was used to legitimize this occupation because a country from that region doing it, it's, it would not look like the U.S. is uh, occupying Haiti, although it's actually that, U.S. Canada doing it, but uh, using Brazil as a shield, as uh, Brazil's name as, as a shield like that. So I hope that that sort of decision, I know that is not on the discussion at the present moment in Brazil, but hope it comes up later while he is in government, Lula is in government, so that that's, that sort of decisions can be rectified and i hope he would also strengthen the existing blocks i know he talks about mercosur a lot and brazil becoming a better economy again would be very important for mercosur uh, that i understand i hope he also has some relation with alba again i mean the last time he didn't he did not join alba bank and not having a strong economy like that is uh drawback for a trade block that wants to be a strong trading block it isn't so i hope that sort of relations can grow i they might not because this time um, his coalition is even broader than the last time i think camilla mentioned it many times so these are like hopes i hope that he does not become another gavil morich that's the most important thing <laughs> yes, uh, camilla yes, have yes, we lost too. you again no, I believe that she's there. I believe that she's there. But anyway, I just want to add that I, I, while you were talking, Camila, I mean, uh, Sahi, Sahili, uh, I just remembered uh, something, another thing that is important that I remember from the time uh, uh, Lula was in power, which was this decision that the Brazilian government took to to push towards a negotiation in the Iranian uh, uh nuclear deal and that's i mean and and that's something that that was that lula is an international decision that lula pushed without the support of the u.s and the gringos were pissed by that decision and brazil brazil anyway i mean pushed towards that you know option at the end of the day the factual powers of the world uh, were the ones that took the final decision and finally did what they did with, 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 with the Iranian government and the nuclear deal. But, but, but I admire at that moment the the the, the decision making uh, strength that Lula shows, not uh, uh, you know submitting or bending towards the you know the the criticism or the 
attacks from the U.S. because they were not supporting this kind of solution for the Iranian problem. Thank you, Camila. I don't know if yeah, you want to Thank you something. so much. Now, I'll speak for two seconds because my phone is going to die. So I'll just put this here on the record because you can include this. But apologies for the bad connection and my phone dying. And if I get cut off in the final recording, it's because I just worry, left Camilla. a, a very big Lula us. rally. But I do want Your to say that. Your audio is I, I, bad again. I don't know what happened yeah. to the audio. I, think, I, I guess I just don't lost worry. connection. So. Don't worry. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Take care. You too. I don't know we'll what be happened. listening. Anyway, I believe that we are done here, Sahi. Yes, I, uh, I would just, uh, I should just me? add, which I did not and neither did you, is that it's since, uh, since Camila is directly reporting from Brazil, we should be following her social media as well. I mean, apart from reading Kausacho news, she actually uploads the um, videos of the rallies that she attends on her yes. social media. I, I have seen them on Facebook. I believe she uploads more on Twitter because she yes. is more active there. So she it's knows. it will be good to follow these things. This is the last week before the election. Last few days, like, but when the last week? I mean, how many days are left? The election is on 2nd October. Uh, so it would be so good to follow like those things. Next Sunday, right? Yes, it's on next Sunday. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's it. Uh, let's, anyway, so let's hope that 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 Lula wins in the first round to make things yes, that, easier. That would be important. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, he Sahili. would win in a second round, but uh, winning in the first round would be the best thing. Yes. So let's hope that that happens. So that's it. Thank I guess you. we are done here. Thank you, Sahili. And thank you, Camila. Un abrazo to everyone. Bye-bye.